cholera came into the United States in 1849 through the port of New Orleans and crept up the Mississippi, the Illinois River, and the canal toward Chicago. It's a devastating disease. And it's very difficult to watch someone with cholera because they become violently ill and often die within hours. Someone described the first attack as like getting hit in the back with a pickaxe. Boom, and you're down. Businessmen faced pressure to close the canal. The argument held that the economic consequences that would result if the canal shut down would be really terrible. And so cholera arrived with a canal boat in 1849. For the next six years, cholera came on lake schooners, bringing immigrants from the east, and on trains. A German wrote of his train being stoned. Cholera, it was believed, was spread by filthy water and noxious fumes, death fogs produced by exposed sewage. Gutters ran with filth, an editor thundered, at which the very swine turn up their noses in supreme disgust. And Chicago started in a swamp. It started in the most unlikely of locations where you never would have chosen to build a city if you had any choice about it at all. But once this growth happens, once all these railroad lines are pointed toward this location, once all this capital has rearranged geography in the way that it does, there is such an enormous incentive to make this site work come hell or high water. The city hired Ellis Chesbro from Boston, one of the best sanitary engineers in the country. He built sewers above the swampy ground so waste could flow by gravity into the river. Chesbro then dredged the river and used the fill to raise the ground level 10 feet. The challenge then was to raise the buildings. For that, he turned to George Mortimer Pullman, son of a carpenter, Pullman dropped out of school after the fourth grade and apprenticed as a cabinet maker. In the early 1850s, he moved to Rochester and perfected a system of moving buildings when the Erie Canal was widened by jacking them up. George Pullman would jack up Chicago. The Pullman method was to put the foundation of the building on jacks that could be turned. Each individual would be responsible for, let's say, four jacks and would give each one a quarter turn at a time. You might have a thousand jacks around the base of a big building and 250 men blow a whistle and they'd all turn one of those a quarter turn or an eighth of a turn or something. And little by little they would jack up the building and other people would be putting bricks in around to, to shore up the foundation. As hotels were raised, diners enjoyed, without interruption, broiled Lake Michigan whitefish a la maître d'hôtel. Chateau Lafitte with their mutton au jus was $5 a quart. Chicago was a city, it was mud, you know. There was Fort Dinner, it was mud, but they did it. They hoisted it and they moved houses. It was mud. I remember interviewing some old woman, she was about 98, when I interviewed her about 35 years ago. So she remembers the mud and walk and the wooden walks and, and the junk and the effluvium and everything that was there on the, on the ground. The sewers worked as planned, draining waste from the city into the river. There, it mixed with waste from the stockyards which flowed into a tributary of the South Branch known as Bubbly Creek from the carbolic acid which rose from discarded, decaying animal parts. One of the McCormicks writes to the old man who's in Paris trying to sell his reapers. Pop, he said, I was up at Clark Street Bridge and I'm looking in the river scarlet. <laughs> Can you imagine that? There's heads of pigs in the river and things like that. 
Uh, and, and, and this is what's flowing out into the lake. The lake was Chicago's water supply, and it already had problems. The intake was not well filtered at the time. Minnows would get into the water system, and you could turn on the tap and, and have a, a fish fall out. Uh, there is a, a line in one of the books of the time describing bathing as a piscatorial pastime. There is a conviction of one Chicago liquor dealer for watering his booze when a pickled minnow was found in the whiskey. Chesbro was hired to develop a new water system. Clean water from the lake bottom would pour into intakes under a crib two miles into Lake Michigan. It would flow by gravity through a tunnel 30 feet below the lake to a pumping station. Then up the 138-foot pipe of a new water tower, from which it would flow into the city's water mains. Immigrants were hoisted down shafts to work 16-hour shifts under Lake Michigan. It was at the time the longest tunnel excavation in history. A contemporary wrote, to the timid, the situation would be a horrible one. The thought that Lake Michigan had broken in and would bury them in the deep grave dug by their own hands would drive them mad. They would imagine the earth caving in on them and engulfing them in a living tomb. They would conjure up demons in the darkness and see horrible shapes in the smoke of the lamps. If all the people of Chicago had been of this sort, he wrote, we should have drank foul water all our days. Chicago's mayor called the tunnel the wonder of America and the world. When the floodgates of the crib were opened in 1867, a reporter for Harper's Weekly wrote, the water went down with a roar of an infant Niagara. water project never worked. Spring rains washed sewage two miles out into the lake, right into the water intakes. Chesbro would have another chance. Chesbro says the way we're going to solve this thing is to do something nobody's ever done in the history of the world. We're going to tell a river to go where God didn't want it to go. We're going to send it another way. We're going to reverse the damn thing. And everyone thought, ah, little cuckoo here, but he did it. To reverse the river's flow, the canal was deepened to eliminate locks that raised boats to the height of land. The river would no longer flow east into Lake Michigan, but west from the lake into the canal and down to the Illinois River. When the project was completed, straw was thrown on the river. At first, it appeared to head east toward the lake. Slowly, it began to head west toward the canal and the Illinois River and the Mississippi. Businessmen honored Chesbro for purifying the river without interfering with the city's business or its unparalleled growth. That's the beauty of Chesborough to the city fathers. He comes in, technology will solve it. Technology will solve it. But he's fed it at banquets because he allows Chicago to grow without changing anybody's behavior, without controlling any of the economic interests who are dumping in the river. And they can continue to use that river as a sewer and send that garbage downriver toward 
less powerful in complaining canal towns. The stench has been almost unendurable, wrote a downstream resident. What right has Chicago to reduce the value of property and bring sickness and death to the citizens? Chicago's elite cared just as little about its own population, the half that were immigrants. Germans who came to Chicago beginning in the 1850s brought their old world traditions with them. They enjoyed lager beer at Sunday picnics after church. They bring their kids. They have the oompa bands, their picnics, their athletic contests. A Sunday out in Ogden Park on the north side of Chicago. They did everything together. None of these stand-up Irish saloons. Typical way for an Irishman to drink is to go to the saloon or a whiskey and stand there till he's, you know, till, you know, till he's perpendicularly drunk. And then he falls on the ground. And then you go home. It's an escape. The whole idea of a bracer after work. What are you bracing for? To face the family. This is a different tradition, the German tradition. This is the America of the six-day work week. This is their only chance for leisure. On the other hand, they drink on Sunday. 